and welcome to Lunch with Lee. I'm your host, Shane Lee. Today on the show, Bradley Clyde, an Australian former rugby league player, playing 230 first grade games for the Canberra Raiders, Canterbury Bulldogs and Leeds Rhinos. He represented New South Wales in the state of origin 12 times and wore the green and gold on 19 occasions. He's an inductee in the Rugby League Hall of Fame and regarded as one of the greatest locks of all time. Post-career, he's worked to help to support former players at Family of League and currently works at Blenheim Partners, an international executive search and board advisory firm. Welcome, Brad. Shane, thanks for the invitation. Mate, thanks for coming. And Garth Wood, an Australian professional boxer and former rugby league player, playing 25 first grade matches for South and Balmain before turning his hand to boxing. He's the first winner of the Contender Australia, earning the right to fight the man Chuck Mundine. And on December 8, he completed his journey by knocking out the man himself in the fifth round. Welcome, Garth. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me. Mate, I want to start with you, Brad, because you are, for me, mate, one of my favourite footballers of all time. So oh, thank great, you. Great to, uh, and I know we bumped to each other, and I'll get to that later, um, many years ago. Um, but that, I just want to ask you first, playing that Raiders team back there you know, in the 90s with some of the biggest superstars, I want to ask you what, what that was like, you know, playing with Daly, Stewart, Walters, Meninga, you know, Chicka Ferguson on the wing. What were those days like for you? Well, I, I started as a, a 17-year-old. Um, Wayne Bennett was coach at the t- uh, of the club at the time, and he invited me along to, to train with first grade as a 17-year-old. Uh, and uh, once a week, the, it was always their fitness session. But... Um, it was pretty cool. I, I was getting their, their footy card signed only 12 months before, you know. <laughs> I love it. And um, so I, I thought you know, I was on cloud nine from that point on. And um, and then a, a year after I, I started playing grade and um, it um, we are learning from guys like Meninga, Belcher, uh, yeah. Peter Jackson, Dean Lance, <laughs> Gary Coyne. All, all these guys were driving the, the culture of the place. Ashley Gilbert was another one. Mm. Um, then uh, for young guys like myself, Lazo, Sticky, Laurie, we were, uh, you know, we were learning how to walk, talk, and and uh, win footy games. Yep. Um, and and just uh, you know, by the best, really, we're, uh, we're being mentored by the best, and, and we didn't know it at the time. This is. Uh, uh, I look back now, I think it was such a luxury to have those guys actually show us. <laughs> how to win footy games and and um, conduct yourself off the field properly as well. Yeah. And, and Garth, like you started, um, talk about, I suppose, being shown the ropes. Your dad, Barry, was was an exceptional footballer himself, played with Newtown. Yeah, dad was uh, Newtown. Uh, he debuted at Newtown. Uh, he played with the likes of a bloke by the name of Brian Chickamore, who represented Australia. Yeah. And as a kid growing up, he ran the Newtown Police Boys. So I was uh, blessed to have dad... You know, some very close friends of his, Ronnie Coote, who was another South champion. Yeah. Bob McCarthy. Um, I had all these pictures of them up on the pool table at home. So dad, Fantastic. So Dad had done all right for himself after footy. And uh, I was just in awe of all Dad's mates, given the fact that I didn't know who they were, but I knew footy was a big thing yeah. growing up in the household where I grew up in. And the likes of the blokes that I saw on the wall and then Dad rubbing shoulders with him was... I wanted to be a footballer. There yeah. wasn't much else that I thought I wanted to do because I wasn't that great at school. Or I was, but just wouldn't pay attention. I always went out of, I had a football in my hand or mucking around, playing chasings, always doing yeah. something active. So I was blessed to give him the fact that Dad uh, had already paved the way and um, I was just I was uh, able to see the lifestyle that a football could have and where, how you could set yourself up and everyone liked someone who was a sportsman or was any good, yeah, okay. at, good at sports. So... I wanted to be, uh, that was my first obsession, I wanted to be a rugby league player. And uh, your brother, Nat, who's hilarious, was on the show a few weeks ago, and um, he was telling a story, excuse me here, Brad, but he was saying he was very good. He was before puppetry of the penis, he reckons, and, he's, and his best move was when he put the tackle through the legs and it was Tiger in the sunset. <laughs> um, did he pass on any of those um, skills to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I let him have that. I don't want to sell his, uh, very sell his fund up because I've got a bit of... I had a good toolbox downstairs too, so I just, I just let him have his day in, his sun, in the sun. It's like a mammoth in the sunset. There you go. <laughs> now, um, Brad, I want to ask you, um, I think we bumped into each other. It was a no- I got called up for the 97 Ashes um, the last game. Uh, it was at the Oval. 
I think the Canberra Fourth boy. Fourth test, wasn't it? The, uh, uh, I think it was the sixth test, actually. Okay. Yeah, and um, and I think you boys, the Canberra boys were all over there playing, and you came in the change room after watching a day's footy. Now, I can't remember who it was, but some, one of the boys, picked, it might have been Big Mal, picked up Justin Langer in the change room and put his head through the roof. And I think Justin, that day, got concussion, <laughs> and that's why he's been so angry ever since. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that day catching I up? I sure do, yes, yes. So we were over there playing the World Club Challenge, and uh, we'd actually got beat by the London Broncos uh, only days before. So we were sort of um, out of that whole program. So, we, yeah, we'd been on the beers ever since. And, uh, we, yes, yes, so we got to the, the, the game and uh, we're looking forward to, to jumping into the sheds and, and uh, catching up with you guys. Uh, I, I think you'd um, square uh, – I, I think you'd – uh, won the series. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Won the Ashes at that stage. Yeah. So we, there was a lot of celebrations going on. Yeah, it's fun. It was always good. It was. It's, it's, um, I could see the excitement from a few of the camera boys to meet a few of the cricketers, but it was the same feeling back towards the, to you guys, the footy players. So it was nice to catch up. Um, I, I want to talk to you too, um, Brad, about uh, you played in three grand finals, 89, 91, 94. Um, you won the Clive Churchill medal twice. Uh, only two blokes have done it, yourself and Billy Slater. But you also won it in a losing team. So that would be a sweet feeling in 91 where you win the best player on ground, but mm. then you, you lose the, the grand final. It is. And at an individual level, you go, you know, it was really well, really nice to get recognised, but uh, from a, a team's point of view and everything that you've been working for yeah. for that whole 12 months you are, is sort of out the window and you come second. I, I've always had that notion where um, uh, you, that commitment of, of um, playing in the, one of the toughest competitions in the world and coming second isn't that yeah uh, it isn't to be um, uh, disgraced. I, yeah. I, I've uh, I, I was really proud of, of, of uh, achieving what we achieved uh, in the toughest arena in, in in the world. And what about the year? Um, uh, it was it nineteen ninety where you did your. Yeah, you see, or something you missed mm. out. That'd be even tougher missing out in the grand final, wouldn't it? It was, yes, yes. Yeah. So I, it was about two months before the the grand final, and we uh, we'd won the the year prior, uh, setting ourselves up for success uh, for the for the whole year. I was really enjoying my football, and and you know injuries, yeah. a key part of sport, and and those ups and downs, and it, it it helps shape you as a person in the end. But at the time, as a twenty year old, I was thinking, oh, this is the end of the world. Garth, I want to ask you, you played, I mentioned at the start, you played 25 NRL matches for both Souths and Tigers. At what point in your career did you think, I'm going to turn my hand to boxing and, and maybe rugby league's not your path? Mate, it was the 99 season. I was at the Tigers and I was in and out of first grade, first uh, reserve grade, first grade. And we got beaten in the grand final against Parramatta with old Red outside, Shane yep. Warrett, uh, Nathan Barnes, um, Marsh was in it. Okay, gotcha. And uh, Junior Pierce was the coach, and it was when they magmated with West, and yep. they promised me a contract, but they reneged. And that, that, like you said, twenty years old, it's your world and everything. Sure. And I was ropeable, filthy, and at the same time, um, I broke up with my first girlfriend. It was my wife. I had two kids too, so I was, went down spiral. Yep. Um, I was hanging with the wrong people. Was, at the same time. Um, I was still going to the gym, and but I wasn't all there. I was. I had two pro fights, and then I went off the rails hard. And then out of the blue, Johnny Lewis rung me. Right. And he goes, "Mate, how are you?" And he's like, "Dad's best mate. He's like a second dad father." And he said, "And I tried to put on a smother." I said, "Yeah, John, I'm sweet. I'm fine." He goes, "Hey, pull up, son. I yep. know you're fucking not in a good place." And he goes, "But I don't want to. I don't know about none of that." He goes, "Yeah, I think I've got something for you. There's a chance you could turn your life wow. around." Shellen Taylor's pulled out of the container. Are you aware of the container? I said, yeah, I am. He goes, well, mate, here's your chance. And I said, oh, leave it with me because I get the kids every second week and I'll see if mum and dad can look after me. Mm. I said, what's going to happen if, if I go into this competition? He goes, mate, you win, you stick around, and you go, you could be in there for eight weeks. So I went and asked mum and dad, and dad, old, tough nut, tough love, he, he knew what I was getting up to for the last 18 months because I was – down in the dumps, missus had left me, didn't yeah. have a football, didn't have a job. And he said straight to me, he said, you're a fucking idiot. You're going to get your head punched in. You're going to end up in hospital. You might get killed. He goes, don't think I don't know what you've been fucking doing. I said, I'm all right. I'm sweet. So he said, fucking snap out of it. <laughs> right? Really? So I said to mum, I said, can you do something? Get something out of the line. And she went, oh, I'll do my best. So she probably Convinced. looked after him that night, 
give him give him a special <laughs> this, <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> whatever this for our throwback break yeah. <laughs> so I said to mum thanks for getting over the line mum <laughs> but I got picked up three days later after Johnny making that phone call saying mate you've only got three days to enter everyone else has been given 14 weeks prep there's a couple of big names in there there's five blokes who are top tenors he goes you're the underdog but mate this is probably I'm not saying you're going to win but this is what you need to turn your life around he goes you've got two daughters and they're only young then they're worried about you everyone's worried about you I said alright so mate I stepped into that ring as an absolute underdog um, more or less novice yep but when I played football, I, I, well, I've always been an athlete. I've not been a big head. I was cross country. I was even when I played. You had a good um, engine. I was regarded as one of the fittest blokes who played rugby league when I was at South. I was yep. breaking all the records. So I've always been a competitor, and I think I stepped into that contender house, and I, I could just feel the transformation. Thinking, "Here's a chance to really you know, make a name for yourself." You only you were shy of being a full time first grader, even and out. Easy, easy opportunity. So it was more the want than anything. I, I was breaking out of the hotel, which you weren't allowed to do in the Ibis and going for big long runs at night because I knew I was 50 lengths behind. But that that soul searching and the run going and just the mentality was Cleared like, your head. I started bawling my eyes out, but out of happiness thinking, here's my chance to wow. turn my life around. And that's exactly what happened. So, so Johnny Lewis obviously did that for a lot of, a lot of guys, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's done it for... Ever since I was a kid, I'd go to the New Down Police Police and you'd hear... He was in jail for 18 months ago. Now he's fighting for an Australian title or Commonwealth title. John just has that sort of personality that he, which he does. Every every guy that he's in the corner with, he's dodging every punch. Every every like, he's your boy. He, he like you're you're his son. Every fighter he treats like he's he's, he's a young he's only yeah. son, and um, you feel that, and he just has a way of building you up and telling you what you want to hear, or not what you want to hear, what you have to hear, not gotcha. what you want to hear, and. Um, you get that bomb with him straight away. And and Brad, so you work, uh, mentioned at the start too, you work with Family of League, which is looking after players post-career. Um, you see a bit of that too, because I always say that the average length of any sporting career across any code is only four years. And some of us are lucky to play longer than that. Um, but you see a lot of guys who really struggle post-sport. Um, and you played with the likes of Peter Jackson, who you know, lost his life. And... Um, what, what what are you seeing with guys post sport these days? Are they, are they they dealing with life after sport, or are they some of them struggling, some doing better than expected? I think there's programs um, better than ever, uh, or certainly better than before that are set up by the NRL to to transition players out uh, because um, once they come into the system. There, um, if if they play two years, I think the average is is only two years right, now, yeah. down Jeez. to something like uh, less than fifty games. Jesus. And um, uh, so, the moment they come into our system, we've got to start educating them and, and mm. preparing them to transition out. And uh, so, the education piece I see is, is vitally important um, for them to be able to constantly make the the right life decisions. Um, I think if, if it's uh, all um, educated and value-based, uh, you're breeding a better player and person. I think they should be run in parallel. I agree. Uh, sure. Yeah. As they're developing their footy skills, they're developing educators, uh, they're being, um, being able to make better decisions in life. Hugely important. And I think sportsmen, um, you live in a bubble. Mm. To give even more now, you see, you see, like the particularly, I don't talk from the creditors' perspective, but you know, you, you don't even carry your bags from the airport to to the hotel. You get to the hotel, it's unpacked for you now. Mm. Mm. Everything's done for you, and and unfortunately, once it stops, there's no one organising your flights. There's no one. <laughs> That's no right. One, no one doing anything for you, booking your hotels. That's right. The evolution of the player agent yeah. is, um, you know, a, a bit of a pitfall for them as well, because as you say, once the player agents. Uh, when they are earning money, the, the, yeah. the player agent is all yeah. around them and, and doing everything for yeah. them. But uh, the moment that income stops, yeah. you know, the, the, the player yeah. agent, uh, you know, by right, he's got to go yeah. and find the next big thing, and yeah. um, so he can. Uh, Speaking generate. about salary, you got a kid that's probably like you said. I started playing grade against men at seventeen, and you also debuted at seventeen. But going from having either living in housing mission or being with a single mother or not having money at all, then getting thrown. 300, 400,000, and then within two years it's been cut and then you've, you've gone from having money left, right and centre and then you don't have it Nothing. anymore and you're thinking, where do we turn to get that sort of money again? And and some people thrive on, the, on, on the, um, the recognition as well, right? Mm. And people 
you know, you're getting girls and you're doing well and <clears throat> mates are patting you on the back. You, you, I read a quote from you, Garth. Um, you said that just with the way that you brought up and where you were brought up, there's always boxing was always going to be, probably be in your future. Well, what did you mean by that? I grew up in the, in Alexandria, Redfern in the 80s, yep. which was um, pretty rough and tumble. Erskineville in itself back in the 60s and 50s was always regarded as, you know, some pretty fierce fighters on the street, this and that. But um, it was very sports orientated. Um, I lived on Mitchell Road, which is across the road from Erskineville Oval, which the Swans yeah. had their home ground there. Redfern Oval, which was only a couple of clicks up the street, was South Sydney Rabbitohs. Mm-hmm. And then I had Newdown Police Boys with the likes of Jeff Fennick, Johnny Lewis, Jeff Harding, Costa Zoo. So if you weren't a sports athlete or you could handle yourself because it was very uh, rough and tumble, mm. a lot of drugs in the area, heroin, um, you'd either turn to crime or you'd get caught up in the drug scene. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at, at, a, at that sort of age as a teenager, everyone does whatever, the you know, you, know, you want the girls to like you, you yep. want to be an athlete, yep. you want to be a good fighter. It's pretty easy to either go one way or the other. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you went the right way. <laughs> and um, I was going to ask you too, so um, back to when you go on the TV show The Contender and you win that and you get to fight a guy, chock the man Mundine, and you knock him out. What was that like? Because I remember, remember that the vision of him on the canvas, and I've I've met Chuck once years ago. And I don't know if you we probably played against him, Brad, but it, people either love him or hate him. Um, yeah. What did you feel around that time? Were people congratulating you, or was it was it, you finding it hard that people were hating on him? Mate, like I told you, I was in within eighteen months or twelve months, or yeah, because I got a little bit more time after the contender to prep, which was the worst thing for him because I went to America and I was sparring blokes that were a better calibre that were over yeah. here in Australia. But what had happened was I grown up, I'd grown up in Redfin and Chuck was in and out of Redfin. His dad was Tony Mundine and they had a gym there, mm. but his dad took him out of Redfin and they moved to Blakehurst for a while, but. I even idolised him. He's a couple of years older than me, mate. He could mm. do everything. Basketball, box, yeah. football. So it was pretty daunting knowing that I've just had eight fights. I've won a reality TV show, but I'm getting in there with a bloke as a three-time world champion. So <laughs> everyone um, well, was divided in the neighbourhood that we all grew up in because yeah. even though he comes across as being a rude, up himself, arrogant son of a bitch or yeah. whatever you want to call it um, – he he actually isn't. He's yeah. just a real smart businessman. He played the, the, yeah, the villain. Mm. No, he's a good, he made yeah, forty guy. million yeah, sure, from it. He's a mummy's boy. He's soft. So, <laughs> and I know him. The whole family yeah. know each other. But I use my mental game to bend him over. And really, you never seen him be in fear of someone, especially someone like me. I was just a novice, but because we'd grown up and we, so we were, were close familiar with each other, to intimidate him. I knew uh, how to get, get under him. And you wow. should see some of the face. There's a thing called a face off. Yeah. We're mean him go head to head, and uh, that's when I knew I had We might get our producer Dan to put that up online too. Yeah, they'll love that. Yeah. And Brad, did you play against him? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Chuck was a a, a great footy player. Yep. And uh, light on his feet. Um, turned his hand to, to, to boxing and um, it didn't surprise anyone that he, yeah. he'd be a success at that as well. Um, and uh, just a, a gentleman, um, good dad, you know, he, yeah. he's a, a, a good person. So, uh, yeah, we've got to know. Our daughters sort of grew up together right. uh, and, and went to school together in the same class f- uh, for a period of time. And, yeah, so I got to know Chuck and... Uh, understand what he was all about. But I want to ask you, since you retired um, and being in and around footy, and I'm obviously still still watching it, um, what's been the biggest change, do you think, in the game last 20 years? I, I think that the professionalism of the, of the game has taken a quantum leap. And yep. um, uh, I, I still think that there's room for uh, to drive a, a, a culture around um, team above all else. So mm-hmm. I, I think that uh, individualism, uh, the, the professionalism has brought the individual, individualism. Yep. Yep. And I, I, I sort of come through in a period where team was above everything. It, yes. Team was above God. It was above your family. It <laughs> yeah. was above, absolutely, you had to invest in that culture or else you didn't make it. And um, I, I think uh, any 
group of people to achieve a common goal, I sort of lean about those times and I say, I need you guys to invest in this and absolutely give everything or else we're not going to win. Our goal is this. There is no excuses environment. We you, know, you can't make any excuses and, and let any interference come in, in way of getting our goals. And so, yes, I, I see that as probably being the, the biggest difference from when I started to, to what it is now. I, I think it, it is very much um, a professional athlete approach and, and methodical. I, I think culturally uh, there's still room for um, a team and groups of people to... Um, uh, absolutely commit to a common goal. It's it's funny when uh, it's so point, on lunch with like that, yeah it? on lunch with Lee I've had um, like a guest from either sport, music, or business. It's funny that the professional athletes are always on time. The musos and that they're always fucking late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah they've actually done the night before. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I, we used to find the the players yes. when I went into the the sports administration. You know, we used to play for a second late. Uh, you, you, and and those it. fines count compound sure. throughout the year. Yeah, you're right. And suddenly you're getting fined five hundred, six hundred dollars for for being a second late. You can be thirty minutes early. That's right. But if you're a second late, you're late. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't. You don't, you don't get bonuses for being early. Um, Garth, I want to talk about in the country right now. A lot of talk about Tim Zhu. Is, it, um, is he the real deal? And, and and who else do you think is coming up in the, from the boxing world? Who should we look out for in Australia? Yeah, in Australia. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think Tim Zhu's the real deal. Yep. I think um, the hurdles he's had to go through just with the bloke pulling out of the fight, but just spending a, a like you learn most in the preparation. You, know, yep. you go through hurdles, um, you get tested. But I think going over to America and planning to fight this Charlo who's pulled out, I think we haven't seen the best of Tim Zoo yet. And I think the guy he's going to fight, he's um, he's got a massive reputation in that, but I think he's there for the picking. And it's going to be awesome that it's a you know, home ground advantage. And, uh, yeah, I think they will not quite sure whether it'll stop him, but I think you'll, if it goes to the scorecards, um, Tim's very um, technical and... He's got a great bloodline. I think, yeah, yeah. he'll come over. Do you see the the smack talk from Zeref this, this morning? Zeref was obviously pulled out 11th hour in that last fight. And Zeref was saying that uh, Tim Zhu is like a, a gold-digging ex-girlfriend. <laughs> he just wants a bout. <laughs> that's good smack talk, I reckon. Wow. Mm. That's, uh, that's I think he's, he's filthy yeah. that he missed the boat. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, it's a big pay, pay down there for the next blokes that Tim fights. And especially if they're trying to make a... Um, like a Lovers quarrel like Denny Green and Chockhead or me and Chockhead, mm. he's probably looking for that just to um, bring up some bullshit so everyone's thinking, oh, it's R- R- Rafa and Tim Zoo. But I think that, that boat sailed a long time ago. Yeah. Now, on a lighter note, I want to ask you both this because <coughs> I always try and find something in common with my, my two guests. So, Brad, um, you turn your hand to acting. You had a little cameo in the 2006 film Footy Legends. <laughs> How'd you find that, mate? Was acting ever going to be in your future? Oh, I've been typecast ever since. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 footy... Um, <laughs> nitwit that <laughs> yeah but uh, no I, I haven't been able to get a, a, another role since uh, I, I um, in, in terms of um, common threads I, I, I did have um, about seven amateur fights back in the day when I was <laughs> right. when I was yeah. a young bloke and because uh, dad uh, used to do a little bit and, uh, and play footy at the same time gotcha. and he was a shearer as well really uh, and then um uh, and I, I sort of soon learned there was no blind side to have a rest on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff this. <laughs> this, is, this is too hard for me. Yeah, I know I said it's, rugby league was the toughest arena in the world. I, I, the, the, the boxing ring is probably first There's and no rugby league there, second. There. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and Garth, and so acting, mate, you're in the current, the, the new um, uh, King of the Cross um, thing. Yeah, I'm in John, two John. episodes. Yeah, so um, episode nine, look out for you. What, what do you play? What? <laughs> I play a drug dealer. <laughs> I had to do a little bit of method acting to find out how to do that. <laughs> nah, on a good note. Um, yeah, I'm in the ninth and the tenth episode. I get chucked out the window by Sam Ibra- Ibrahim. Um, right. But as a kid, I actually um, got picked on. I actually was in a few commercials as a kid. I went to New Down High School Performing Arts, but um, I found so, so I let's love. talk about that. So you, before you turned to rugby league... To boxing, you are in the school for performing arts. As a kid, I think I was 10, I was in, remember the Corey ad? Yeah. I should sue him because my hair's gone now, but I was in the Decore ad, remember? Duh, yeah. Duh, duh, duh. I that was one. in that as a kid, I was in a few few different right. commercials, Very Big cool. Ben Pies. I loved it, money was good. 
Um, you soap it up in the shower, were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was getting picked on, so I was halfway. I stopped doing it, but I fell in love with footy. But then when I stopped boxing and that, um, I still like to get in the character. Like you can yeah. see if you have watched this episode, I'm, I'm playing a junkie. Uh, I'm not a junkie drug dealer, but um, yeah, hopefully some more come about after they see. I don't get typecast as a drug dealer all the time, no. so let's see what happens. I look forward to watching. Well, your, your brother reckons the reason you had such good footwork in both rugby league and boxing is because you, you're doing a bit of uh, theatre work in, in yeah, your fallen years. Yeah, tap dancer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brad, um, concussion's a big thing at the moment in footy. Um, firstly, how, how have you post footy? Have you had any effects of it? No, nothing at all. That's great. I, I've, I feel great. The, the body's fine. I, th- I, I think if you uh, keep moving, keep yep. stretching and, and uh, doing some sort of yep. training and exercise, it will, things will fall into place. For, gotcha. Yes. Yeah, because it's, um, it, it's got to be a real worry because at some point, they're doing a lot of research on it now, at some point they're going to prove that there is detrimental effects to people who get concussed a number of times. Do you think that's going to affect football or sport in general? contact sport in the future with kids not being allowed to play or insurance going premiums going through yeah. the roof I think it is, has already with that yeah. there's a what's the deal with the if you get roughed up and you got to go off is yeah, that yeah. Right now? yeah what do they call it oh the head bin yeah, um, the head yeah. Bin. but uh, yeah the, it was a class action in, yeah. in uh, the, the states with the NFL AFL, yep. AFL uh, too didn't uh, you get a player an AFL player uh, I'm not quite sure so there is some precedent mm-hmm. there to sort of follow um and that was like a four billion uh, class action that um, got a lot of airplay. Mm. Um, I, I think uh, you know ours is a physical game. It, yeah, it it's is. a it's a formula to f- that people have loved for a long time. Big blokes running, bashing, each other. Uh, bashing he- yeah. the hell out of each other. And um, uh, I, I don't know, um, you know, we, we, if you could play the game without that level of contact mm. uh, for it to be successful. So uh, can we find some sort of balance or uh, yeah. uh, some sort of uh, even killed? Uh, I, I think um, you know, sport will probably find a way because it, it um, uh, creates so much human interest. Yeah, I played so, both sports and I got hurt more in footy than boxing. I, got, I remember I got – it was um, Darren Smith. Yeah. And I was playing the Broncos one day and ran off. When does he chip over the top? He usually just goes run straight around someone. <laughs> and I was playing fullback. I was up in the line at the scrum and I turned the chase. He chipped. Darren Smith come from the other side and kneed me in the back of the head. Blind side, yeah. And I had a fit for about three, or, yeah, about three minutes. And oh. the ref just kept playing on. And your brother, he ran on yeah. the field and rolled me over, took my mouth guard out and then give the ref a mouthful because the Gee, ref kept is. playing on. But I had never been knocked out hard in boxing, but... The big humans running each other in collisions. It's going to happen, isn't it? My, my son, Thomas, is only seven. Um, he started to do tackle um, for Moss and Rugby. So he got his first mouse guard and headgear last weekend. Only problem is he's been tackling his sisters around the house. <laughs> <laughs> he's love. They're starting yes. to get the shits. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, the, the litmus test will come when he, yeah. instead of tackling the sister, he's got to tackle the, 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 the big kid, uh, <laughs> Tong and kids that are <laughs> running full steam ahead. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's character building uh, yeah. for, for young boys and, and opportunity for young girls now to really sort of test themselves. And uh, uh, it, it's been a, a great growth element to our game. It, it's uh, both sexes to to um, challenge themselves uh, uh, in a, a, a sport that um, isn't easy. No. So I ask everyone the same question that comes on lunch with <laughs> Lee. I ask you first, Brad. Um, what advice would you give to a young boy or girl who wants to go into the world of rugby league right now? Well, if you're really enjoying it, the whole journey, uh, I, I would recommend um, a, a, a f- professional career. Uh, yep. it, set your sights. Um, start designing a few goals. Yep. And... Um, uh, how can I be the best? Mm. And, and and start um, shaping. Uh, yeah, mm. start mapping it out. Think about it from an early age. And and um, if you because if you're really into it and that's what you want to do, you'll end up a, a, achieving it. Anything's possible. Yeah, great, great advice. Um, and Garth, a young boy or girl wants to go in the world of boxing. What advice would you give him? I'd advise him not to. If it was my son, not really? being rude, but yeah, it's a it's a brutal sport. Right, it's probably the worst out there. But like you said, if you've got nothing else and you love it, just don't take any shortcuts. Uh, be honest with yourself. Get, get in a good good team and a good coach, and you know they're going to have your back because uh, it's such a brutal sport, you know, in and outside the boxing ring. If You know, I'd advise them not to because 
I've seen some shady parts of the sport, but if you do anything, you do it 100%. You don't get on the piss. You yep. don't hang with the wrong crew because it's all about um, how much you want it. You yeah. know what I mean? And it, obviously, if you're out on Saturday night and you get a fight the next week, mate, you shouldn't be in the sport. No, well said. Well, I want to thank you both for coming on Lunch with Lee. We're here at the Mossman Rowing Club here in Mossman Bay. Beautiful setting. The sun's shining outside. We're going to go downstairs now and have a, a nice lunch. I think... Um, I know Brian Beer will go down well. He's one of our great sponsors <laughs> of the show and sponsors <laughs> of the show. And